If you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5 will be our text this Lord's Day as we continue to walk through the Scripture together. And as you turn there, I just want to mention a couple of families that we're going to pray for before we begin our time of study this morning. As most of you are aware, we lost two church members this week. Miss Elva Wigington, who was our oldest uh, church member, she was nearly 101 years old, uh, and she passed away uh, earlier. Uh, we had the funeral early in the week, and then uh, tragically, there was an auto accident this week, and Mr. Charlie Mattingly passed away and had his services yesterday. And so uh, as we think about those things, we are reminded that uh, we don't know our tomorrows, we're not promised tomorrows. And we may live to be 100, 101 years old, or our life may end rather quickly. And so we are called to trust in the Lord. We're called to pray that God would certainly bring comfort to these families, and especially uh, to Charlie's family, to Sheehan and their three children. And so we're going to pray for them uh, before we start our study in God's Word today. So if you would just pray with me for a moment. Father, we do pray for these families. We lift up to you, the Wiggingtons, as you blessed Elva with a, a very long life. But yet there's still grief and there's still mourning there. And so we, we pray for them in their time of grief, Lord, that you would bring them comfort. And we pray as well, Lord, for the Mattingleys and, and a life that seems to have been ended so short and so quickly. And I pray for Sheehan right now, Lord. I pray, God, that you would bring her comfort, that you would bring her children comfort, Lord, as they mourn and as they grieve this sudden loss of Charlie. And Lord, I thank you uh, for the testimony of Charlie's faith that was so evident in our conversation, so evident in his walk with the Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the confidence that we have in what your word tells us, that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Lord, I thank you that, that we can have comfort and those who have gone before us, who have truly trusted in Jesus, that we, we know they're with you, and that for those of us who have placed our trust in Jesus, uh, where they are, we will one day be. So we lift up these families to you today, and we pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning in our study, we come to 1 Samuel chapter 5, and if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know a little bit about the context of what's going on here. Uh, the Israelites, God's people, are at war with the Philistines. And what we see among the Philistines is that they were uh, a godless people. They were uh, a people who had crept in now to Canaan. And, and now we see this war between uh, the Israelites and the enemies of God. Uh, the Israelites go into battle and they are defeated. 4,000 of their soldiers are killed. Their enemies are victorious. And so they come back and they quickly ask the right question. Uh, why has God defeated us? They understand that God is sovereign, that he's allowed their enemies to conquer them. And yet they don't fully take time to answer that question. They quickly uh, try to come up with their own answer to it. And their answer is, uh, we need God's power and we need to harness God's power. And so they take the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, out of the temple there. And they take it with them into battle. As if they could somehow harness the power of God. Well, this does not go well with them, for them. 30,000 more of their soldiers are slain. And now their enemies have captured the Ark of the Covenant. On top of all this, we see uh, God's word coming to fruition. The, the prophecy that had been given that these worthless priests, these wicked priests, the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, that they would die and they find their death in that battle when Eli hears the news of this, Eli himself falls over backwards and he dies. And then we ended chapter 4 with this account of Phineas' wife who was pregnant at the time and is overwhelmed with grief and goes into childbirth and she herself dies. But before she dies, she names her son Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. And so the way chapter 4 ends is there's this picture that, that all hope has been lost. That the glory of God is gone from the Israelites. The priests are dead. The ark is gone. The enemies are victorious. And they've been defeated. But as we'll see in today's passage, the defeat of God's people is not the defeat of God himself. He does not need us to win his battles. 
but we desperately need him. So with that introduction, let's look now to 1 Samuel chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and out of reverence for God's word, if you would stand, if you're able, as I read this text for us. And this is what the word of God says. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both of his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priest of Dagon's and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod. And he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of God of Israel there. But after they brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us or our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. And the hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. You would pray with me. Father, it is a certain, certainly a fearful thing to, to fall under your wrath and the heaviness of your hand. And yet this is exactly what we rightly deserve for our sin and yet, Lord, you give us hope through the gospel of Jesus. You call us to repentance and faith and trust. And you cover us through his atoning work. Lord, help us to realize these gospel truths as we consider an account and a story from the scripture that perhaps we haven't spent much time on before. Help us to see how 1 Samuel chapter 5 is applicable to us today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Hopefully most of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis and some of his great works. One of them was Mere Christianity. And in Mere Christianity he wrote this, and I think it's a, a very helpful statement as we consider what it means to really know the God who is, the God who has revealed himself to us. This is what Lewis said about God. Every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not in a sense his own already. So that when you talk of a man doing anything for God or giving anything to God, I will tell you what it's really like. It's like a small child going to his father and saying, Daddy, give me sixpence to buy you a birthday present. Of course, the father does, and he is pleased with the child's present. It's all very nice and proper. 
But only an idiot would think that the father is sixpence to the good on the transaction. When a man has made these two discoveries, God can really get to work. It is after this that real life begins. The man is awake now. See, the point of what Lewis is saying there, that that, that we are like children going to a parent and saying, give me money so I can buy you a gift. And then we give these gifts to our parents, but they're really none the richer because what they received is what they had already given us. This is a picture of our benevolent and loving God. He is entirely self-sufficient. He does not need us, and yet he invites us in to his kingdom work. But we need to always remember, he's not dependent on us for this work to come to fruition. And yet what we find in his word is that we are entirely dependent on him. And that's the lesson I want us to consider as we begin walking through this passage together today. And I place this there in your outline. Point one, God doesn't need us, but we desperately need him. And so the picture here again is that the Philistines have conquered the Israelites And in conquering the Israelites, they've taken the ark of God from them. And now they've brought it back to their home, to their place, to their temple, to a false god, Dagon. And they have set the ark of God in this temple. Now in context, in the ancient world, this was a common practice. It was a picture of defeat. Essentially what the Philistines were saying was, our God is more powerful than your God, so we're going to set this symbol of your God at the feet of our God because our God has conquered your God. Well, that all seems well and good. Dagon to them was their principal God. It was their principal deity. It was the false God that they worshipped. The name Dagon is likely derived from a word that actually means grain. And so this would have made Dagon an agricultural god or a fertility god. This is a picture of what we saw in our study of Exodus where we saw the Egyptians worshiping false gods. And normally they attributed these false gods to things like the sun or things like agriculture or things like fertility. So if they wanted to have a better crop, they would make a sacrifice to the god of agriculture. Or if they were having troubles with their crops, perhaps that meant they hadn't sacrificed enough. And so we see in this ancient world this pagan practice of making these specific sacrifices to these gods. And it would seem this is the case with Dagon, their false god. They have a temple to Dagon. And so we see here them putting the ark in front of Dagon. And this all seems well and good for them until they come back the next day. And then there's this rather humorous picture as they walk into their pagan temple and here they have their idol to Dagon, the statue of Dagon, laying on the ground. And not just laying on the ground, but face downward in the ground laying before the ark. So what do they do with their great God? They have to pick him up again. And so they pick up this idol of Dagon and they leave and the next day they come back. And now not only is Dagon back on the ground, but he has been beheaded. His head is taken off. His hands are taken off. Now, this has significance in the context in the ancient world. As barbaric as this sounds to us today, it was common practice when an enemy was defeated to remove their head and their hands. This was a picture of utter defeat. This was a picture of conquering them. This is the picture we'll see as we continue in 1 Samuel. You'll remember uh, probably from what you've studied before. When David slays Goliath, what does he do? He removes his head from him. And so this picture means something. Both to the people of God as they would hear stories of it. And certainly to the Philistines as they experience it. Not only is their idol laying there before the Lord, but his head has been removed, his hands have been removed. It is a picture that the true God of Israel is really the one who is victorious. And it makes an impression on them. And we see in the text here that as time moves forward and as now this has been chronicled by Samuel or someone else and handed down to generations that would come, that there was still this practice of the priest of this false god Dagon where they would avoid the threshold. They wouldn't even walk on the threshold of the temple because that's where the head and the hands of Dagon, their false god, were laying. 
And so it makes quite an impression on these pagan people. And it should make an impression on us as well. Because it reminds us that God does not need us to win battles for him. Dagon falls down. And he needs the Philistines to pick him back up. But our God needs no man to pick him back up. He is entirely self-sufficient. He doesn't need his people to cheer him on. In fact, look at the big picture here. God's people go into battle, they're defeated. God's people go back into battle, they're defeated. And the ark is taken. And how will God return the ark to his people? Not one Israelite will go to battle to win back the ark. God himself will bring the ark back because he does not need them. In fact, there's an irony here. As you consider the picture of the Israelites marching into battle carrying the ark of God as if they could harness the power of God, as if they are doing something in their own power to bring God into battle. And yet what happens to them? They are conquered, they are ruined, they are defeated. And God is the one who brings the ark back. If there is carrying to be done here, it is God carrying his people, not the people carrying their God. And I believe this is the wake-up call that C.S. Lewis is referring to in mere Christianity. This understanding that to truly be used by God, we need to first understand that God doesn't need us. And that he's entirely self-sufficient. He will win his battles with or without us. And what this means for us, this wake-up call, is one in which we then have a higher view of God and a lower view of ourselves. But, but our tendency is to have a lower view of God and a higher view of ourselves to where we think we're pretty important, to where we look at things and think, well, if I don't do this, and if I don't get involved here, well, this, this just isn't going to work out. As if our involvement will make God successful or not. And yet we see this picture in the Scripture that God doesn't need us to win our battles. In fact, what we see here is that there's times when God allows his people, sovereignly plans for his people to be defeated in order that he might expose our wrong thinking about him and reveal the idols that are in our lives that perhaps we did not see before. Which brings us to the next point there in your outline. Number two, God uses suffering and pain and defeat to expose our idols so here's the Israelites, and here's God exposing their bad theology. He's showing them that their rabbit foot religion doesn't work. He's calling them out for making his ark, that sacred box covered in gold that he had a purpose for, they made it into an idol. They looked to it as if it was the power of God. And in doing that, God's revealing to them the idol they made it. He lets them suffer in order to expose their idols and their wrong views of him. And now he's going to bring judgment against the Philistines and expose their weaknesses and their idols as well. And so we read there in verse 6 that the hand of the Lord was heavy against the Philistines. In fact, the scripture says here, he terrified and afflicted them with tumors. Now that sounds terrifying. But it's worse than it sounds. I'm going to predict that I'm about to set before us what you're going to talk about at lunchtime. That the translation, this is just me doing word study here, so that the translation of this word and many of our English translation, this tumors, doesn't really give us the full picture of what he's actually saying. In fact, when you study this word in the Hebrew, and my wife's already grinning, this is actually a reference to hemorrhoids. Let that sit for a second. <laughs> the, the closest English translation we have is in the King James, which uses an ancient word for hemorrhoids here. And so you may think, I mean, how do you know you have a tumor in your body? Yes, tumors can become evident, but if this is what you have, what's well, evident really quick? 
So God is really, really, really reflecting these people. In fact, if you're familiar with Jerome and the Latin Vulgate, the Latin translation of the scriptures, I like the way he translates verse 6. He says this, He smote them in the more secret parts of their posteriors. I would prefer the ESV read it that way because it gives a real specific picture of what's going on here. God has brought against these people something terrifying. And so their response is what? We want to be rid of this. We have the hand of the Lord against us. In fact, in verse 7 they say, The ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for the hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. Now notice what's taking place there. On one hand, because of this physical affliction that's come upon them, they're acknowledging the heavy hand of the Lord is against them. And yet they're still not willing to repent of their pagan worship. They want to continue with their idol. They want to be rid of the wrath of God. You see here a picture of how God used these pagan people to bring defeat against his people, but now he's using these pagan people to bring defeat against them. And in some ways, the Philistines here have a better understanding of how God works than the Israelites do. The Israelites were defeated in battle, and their response was, let's harness the power of God. The Philistines now are experiencing this severe affliction And they're attributing it to God, but rather than turn to Dagon or some other false god and start making a bunch of sacrifices and find ways to harness power, they simply acknowledge, this is the power of God against us. How can we remove the wrath of God from us? And so they think, well, we'll take the ark and we'll move it to another city, which, you know, imagine in this context, then it comes to your city. (laughs) The people aren't really pleased by that because this affliction, word has spread, And they don't want it, but they get it. So now they're going to move it somewhere else, and they're going to move it somewhere else. And eventually, they come to the point where they realize that everywhere we move the ark, God's going to keep bringing this affliction. We've got to get it back to the proper place. We've got to get it back to the Israelites. Again, God does all of this without one Israelite lifting one finger. Reminding us that he doesn't need us. In fact, he is using their defeat to reveal this idol in their lives and in the lives of the Philistines. Now we read this and we may find this to be very unapplicable to us today. We think of idols as golden carved figures, as structures that people bow down before. And you may think this morning, well, pastor, I don't have any idols in my home and I don't struggle with idol worship. But I want to propose to you that I think perhaps you do. And I think perhaps I do. And they may not take the forms of wooden carvings. They may look entirely different. But we have our idols nonetheless. A.W. Tozer says it this way in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Let us be aware, lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion that idolatry consists only in kneeling before visible objects of adoration, and that civilized peoples are therefore free from it. Now hear this. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. Hear that again. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. This is what we see plaguing the Christian world today. This is what we see when we closely examine our own hearts. That that we have false views of God. That we have erroneous notions about who God is. And these, friends, are idols. And God has a way of exposing them in order that we might either repent of them or that he might one day bring judgments against us for them. And so we need to consider when we think about idols, these may be very different things than anything we've ever thought to be an idol before because any false idea you have about God is in itself an idol. So I'll take one that may be common to a number of us. Have you ever struggled with thinking that God doesn't care about you? I mean, have you ever been 
in a situation where perhaps so many bad things were happening in your life. Perhaps you were watching people you love suffer, and then if that weren't enough, then other things happened, and it just seemed over and over and over again, everything that could go wrong went wrong, and you found yourself sliding into the thought, maybe God just doesn't care about this. Maybe God isn't concerned about these problems. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands this morning, but I think if I did, a number of us would identify with having that thought, with being anxious at times, being worried at times, being overwhelmed at times because we feel like everything is on our shoulders because we've gone before God with it and we've asked him to lift this burden, but yet it still seems to stay there. And so we're anxious and we're overwhelmed and we struggle with this thought, God, do you really care? Well, what does God's word say to this? Does God really care? Jesus in Matthew's gospel is recording and saying this in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need all of them. But seek first the kingdom of God, And his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Summary. Jesus says God cares. And he says to us in our anxiety. In our worry. In our fret over provision or over anything else. He says look at the birds. (laughs) And look at the fields. And if God cares about these aspects of his creation, how much more does he care about his children? God cares. And when we develop this idea, this thought that perhaps he doesn't, then there you have an idol. And there we come to Matthew 6. And we're faced with this decision. Will we, begin, will we continue to believe that God doesn't care? Or will we repent of that idol and trust that he does? This is the difference between the God we want and the God who is. That quote I've shared many times in our study of 1 Samuel, I'll share again. There is a God we want and there is the God who is and they are not the same God. And the turning point in our lives is when we stop seeking the God we want and we start seeking the God who is. And friends, to seek the God who is means we seek him on his terms. And we stop trying to fashion a God in our own image. And God has a way of using suffering and defeat and hardship in our lives, of exposing these idols that we might repent of them. And yet, what do we see in 1 Samuel 5? And the Philistines don't repent. That their hearts are hardened. They just try to figure out a way to remove God's judgment. But friends, the picture of Scripture is this. God's judgment cannot be removed. It will come. And either that judgment will come on our behalf, on Christ on the cross, or it will come on us in the end. We will either trust in him or we'll trust in ourselves. Here we see the Philistines trust in themselves that they don't repent. What we learn is there's no escaping God's judgment. Which brings us to the third point. 
Point three, God will destroy every idol and judge the people who worship and serve them. And so as we conclude this chapter, we see that God not only humbles and slays the idols that are set up against him, but he also judges the people who worship and serve them. So the Philistines are under God's judgment, and they're trying to remove it by moving the ark. And everywhere the ark goes, the people suffer. His judgment continues. It becomes evident that his hand is heavy against them. So they send out for their leaders, they gather them all together, and they decide, we've got to take the ark back. And what we see from these pagan people is something we did not see from the Israelites in their defeat. Verse 12. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. These pagan people again seem to understand things a bit better than God's own people do. For they are crying out to heaven for relief. And that concludes this chapter and this account of the Philistines and the ark. So what are we to learn from this story today? Well, friends, I believe 1 Samuel chapter 5 contains in it the story of the whole Bible. This is the message of God's word. It is the picture of God's triumph over the false gods and the false idols that are all around us. It's a picture of a sovereign God who creates all things and manages the affairs of man in such a way that he receives the ultimate glory with or without us. He doesn't need the Israelites to rescue his ark. He can do so without involving even one Hebrew man or woman. He doesn't allow the defeat of his people to defeat his plan. He didn't in 1 Samuel and he doesn't do that today. And we need to remember that. Because we walk around today in 2020. Surrounded by wickedness in our streets and ungodliness all around us. And we are tempted to hold our heads low. Like we have lost something. Like we need to take something back for God. We act like the future of God's kingdom hinges on a political election or the moral behavior of people. And we hold these things as if we hold them all in our hands, as if God is going to lose something. But we need to understand that God's plans will come to fruition no matter what. They always have and they always will. I think we would do good to turn off the news and to open up the word of God more and to remember that truth. Because when we do that, our idols are exposed and we're reminded of God's sovereign hand at work and how his plans come to fruition. We're reminded here in 1 Samuel during one of the darkest times in Israel's history that God was not defeated when his people were, that he had a plan And he would bring it to fruition. And friends, we need that reminder today. As we consider things that have been lost in our world, lost in our culture, battles we feel that we have lost or we may lose, know this. God has lost nothing. And God reigns victorious and he always will. And our time in human history is a dot On a long line of salvation history, nations will rise and fall, generations will come and go. But our God will remain victorious forever. So let's trust in him today. And let's seek him today. And let's not hold our heads low. Let's hold them high and set our gaze on the finish line that he's called us to. A new heaven and a new earth and the glory that awaits. If you would stand together as we pray to that end, and as we sing once more. Father God, we thank you that you are the victor, that you are victorious, that that your glory is not diminished by the wickedness we see around us. And that in your goodness and your grace and your sovereign plan, you have invited us into that plan. You've called us to be active in this wicked world we live in. 
You've called us to be people who speak out with the voice of truth, who strongly proclaim the gospel, who who seek to influence this wicked world we live in. But Lord, help us as we do that things, as ambassadors of Christ, to remember that the battle is yours and that you win. Help us to trust in you this and each day. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.